Okay, we've got another wonderful talk by Vera. This is really interesting. She's going into the spooky cemetery. <laughs> hey, yeah, well, as Linda mentioned, I'm dealing with graves in the T4 parking lot cemetery. I'm looking at how to um, improve GPR or ground penetrating radar usage in locating unmarked grave shafts within the P4 parking lot cemetery. So first of all, it's important to understand what ground penetrating radar actually is. So GPR is a geophysical tool that non-intrusively uses electromagnetic magnetic waves to locate features in the ground. For instance, grave shafts relating to my project. And here is an image of our GPR. It's not like totally put together, but this is generally an idea of what it looks like. So GPR works by transmitting an electromagnetic wave down into the ground where it'll bounce off of a subsurface feature and then return back to the receiver. And the time it takes to do that will then be translated as a depth. So the longer time indicates a deeper feature while well, a shorter time indicates a feature closer to the surface. And this wave can be altered depending on the frequency of the wave you use. So lower frequencies are gonna have a longer wavelength and they're gonna reach, be able to reach deeper down into the ground but they're not gonna have a good resolution when compared to like a higher frequency wavelength. And while those wavelengths have that good resolution, they can only go relatively shallow into the ground. So I'll miss the deeper features you can see with the lower frequency antenna. And for this project, I use a 200 megahertz antenna. And that's just so we can get a good depth, but also have like a pretty decent um, resolution since we're not like looking like three meters into the ground. It's just around a meter is where we typically expect to find graves. Now, another thing that affects this process is the conductivity of the soil. So whether that's due to soil composition just being naturally more conductive in some places than others, or higher moisture content, making the soil more con conductive than others, that conductivity will attenuate the wave, weakening it, and leading to a lower accuracy of our interpretations of the subsurface. So GPR usually produces results in what is called a radiogram. So this is a cross-sectional view of depth. So over here is that depth on the y-axis, and the x-axis is the distance of the line or transect that you take with the GPR. And so features show up as these little parabolas over here. So you can see them as like a distinct from the area around them. And the location of this feature is represented by this apex of the parabola. So in this radiogram, this feature would be around like 3.1 meters along that transect that I have taken. And this isn't typically what like the raw radargram will look like because when GPR produces a radargram, you, there is possibly a case where you can just use that raw data, but typically you have to process it so that you can actually see what you're looking for. And so I added three filters to this radargram and all my other radargrams. So the first one is called DWOW. So I unwowed my data. And what that does, is it basically normalizes these wavelengths to zero so that you can easily compare between one kind of radar radar gram taken at like this time versus another one. And then another feature that does kind of something similar is called background subtraction. And what that does is that it de-emphasizes these horizontal areas because when you're looking for objects, these horizontal areas represent like no objects. So we don't really care about those. We don't really like need to see them. And so since we are looking for those objects, I applied something called a gain filter. And what a gain filter does is that because of the way the wave behavior works as it gets deeper into the ground, what happens is that it will just naturally become weaker the deeper it goes. So subsurface features will show up as less important in the raw data than they actually are. So what the gain does is that it strengthens those lower signals so that it actually represents the sort of substance that is actually there. So these radiograms have a lot of applications. They're used in archaeological sites to find buildings. Like, for instance, here, there is a wall. It's imaged right here. And the GPR was used specifically in this site because there was already a bunch of damage done to the site. So the scientists didn't want to go in and damage it more. And GPR just works across the surface. You don't have to like dig or like break the surface at all. And it can also be used to get a look at the sediment depth of the below a lake bottom. So here they put GPR in a little inflatable boat and took it across the lake and then formed this profile over to the left. 
So you can even use it with glaciers. So glacier bed topography is typically generated by modeling. There's like large uncertainties unless you calibrate that with actual data. So here, that actual data came from GPR. So here you can see the reflections off of the glacial bed right here. And they use that to generate this little profile of the glacial bed down here. Okay, so while GPR is great and has all those applications, it's not perfect. As I mentioned before, a high conductivity interferes with the strength of the wave. And so a high moisture content, higher conductivity, worse results, more conductive soil composition is the same thing. But also is that there is a lot of things in the ground and you're probably not looking for all of them. So when I'm looking for the grave shafts, there are other disturbances such as animal burrows or tree roots that will show up in the radar grams as well. And, you know, they're just kind of like noise that or that's hiding other signals. So the Peak Farm parking lot cemetery is my study site. It is this flat fenced off field that's by the parking lot, just like just past precarious if you want to stop by. And so it doesn't really have a standard sediment profile because a lot of it is now just backfill from construction that took place. And during that construction is actually when these grave shafts were excavated so that we know that there are grave shafts here since this is like a ground truthing project. And I just want to emphasize that at no point were human remains disturbed, it's literally just the very top of the grave shafts. So this cemetery uh, was present probably due to a pandemic in the mid 18th or 19th century. And due to that, it's not ideal for GPR usage, which is part of the problem here because these graves are small and there, there's really no structure to where they're placed. So they're like stacked on top of each other and they can like hide each other from the GPR. So it's just difficult all around. The goals of this project is to help the CW Foundation improve their ability to locate these unmarked graves, which as I just mentioned, are fairly difficult to do. And by doing that, I'm gonna just contribute to an overall wealth of knowledge on how to use GPR under different environmental conditions. And in order to do that, I need to figure out how, what the effect of soil moisture is on GPR interpretations. And in this project, it's specifically to locate grades. So the way I went about it is I took out the GPR to P4 and I took transects across the area and I used those to combine with soil moisture data and generate images of the subsurface. And using those subsurface images, I approximated the burial and hotspot locations as centroids so that I can then find the distance between one hotspot to its nearest burial and use that to represent accuracy. So a lower distance will indicate greater accuracy and a higher distance will indicate lower accuracy. That's probably important to know what I mean when I say hotspot. So here's what I mean by hotspot. So some are more intense than others, but generally anything that is in that dark blue color represents some kind of subsurface anomaly, whether there is actually a grave there or not. And so the way this is generated is from our old friend, the radar gram. <laughs> so here is the transects item, right? So he, and then these, these lengths right here of the transects correspond with the distance up here. So for each transect, there is a corresponding radar gram that then represents the subsurface under that transect with this colored feature right here. So that's what I said when I mean like at like th about three meters along one of those transects, there will be this little object. And by compiling each of those radar grams for each transect, you can then develop this subsurface map. And with this map, what you can do is that each little like cliff that it shows is the distribution of those subsurface features at a certain depth. So you can like scroll through and as you see, it's getting deeper and you can see how these features change with depth. Okay, so the, this is the grid I took in July 14th. It does look like a parking lot, but it's not actually a parking lot right now. It just used to be one, which is important because you can't really take soil moisture through concrete. But basically I chose July 14th because this was the day with the lowest soil moisture. And then I will later compare it to a day with the highest soil moisture just to see how that soil moisture content affects my results. So this is the soil moisture map for July 14th. I took it, I took the soil moisture readings at rest, the GPR at the very beginning of the transect and then in one meter increments along each transect. And I put them into Excel and used the fun Excel feature to set the lowest value of about 9% 
soil moisture content by volume to up to 38% and use that to distribute the colors around. And then, like I mentioned before, I took a depth slice from that subsurface map. This is at about 0.7 meters. And then I overlaid it with the burial locations and shapes that I got from Eric from the CW Foundation. And then I went and I drew in the shapes of the hotspots that I determined based off of what I thought the shapes looked like. So then using this, I put it into GIS where I used the centroid tool to find those center points of each shape to represent their location and found the distance between the hotspot to the nearest burial. And then I graphed those results. So on the X axis is just the number that I assigned to the hotspot shape is for record keeping. And then on the Y axis is the distance from that hotspot to the nearest burial, which once again is representing accuracy here. So overall it was about, there was the, the distance was about 0.5 meters to one meters, with this sort of outlier section right up here. Found that the average was about 1.176 meters while the median was 0.845 meters. And I did that again, as I mentioned, for a day with high soil moisture, specifically a couple of days after Hurricane Ian. This is once again, those are the grids that those are the transects that I took. Here is the soil moisture map. So even though the colors are the same as July, the gradient is actually different because it's Hurricane Ian, there's a lot more precipitation. So the lowest value is actually about 19% water by volume, while the highest is about 50% water by volume. And here's that subsurface map for Hurricane Ian. I can just appreciate for a second. Okay, and this is that depth slice. It's at the same depth, depth about 0.7 meters. And I, once again, I just went in, I overlaid the burials, I took hot spots, I found centroids, I found distances, and then I graphed it. So once again, it's about 0.5 to 1 meters on, or like typically with some outliers, with the average being about 1 meter and the median being about 0.8 meters. Okay, now we get to compare them. So first of all, looking at this, you can see that, as I mentioned before, Ian was a lot wetter overall than July was. But also you can see that Ian is a lot greener as opposed to July where there's a bunch of like bright yellows and bright blues. So the mo soil moisture content for July was a lot more variable than it was right after Hurricane Ian. And you can see that this proof, not just by colors, this is the standard deviation. So you can see that Ian is a lot closer together while July is more spread out. Okay, and then here are the comparisons with the subsurface map. Once again, just like appreciating how they change. Okay, um, this is the comparison of the depth slice. Once again, same depth. But the two things here are is that July, the in July the hotspots are more clustered together. And they're also more clustered just in that top left corner of the graph, as opposed to in Ian when they're more spread out and they're more isolated. And what that does is that since they're more spread out and isolated in, it's actually more likely that they'll be closer to a burial because the burials are also all spread out. And that won't necessarily be true depending on the geometry of the graves themselves. Okay, this is a fun part. We get to compare the centroid distances July 14th to Hurricane Ian. And so what this is actually showing is that since the average and the median distances for Ian are less than the average and median distances for July 14, that actually indicates that the GPR was more accurate during right after Hurricane Ian, which is weird because that's when the soil moisture content was higher, which means the conductivity was higher, which should have meant that it was less accurate. And when I first saw this, I was confused and a little stressed out because I didn't know why this was happening and I was not expecting this. But we can explain this with that soil moisture map, right? So once again, Ian is a lot greener. The soil moisture gradient is a lot more homogenous as opposed to in July. And what this means is that while soil moisture is like an effect on the accuracy, this shows that it's actually about the moisture gradient itself. So there's more variability in July, which is like interfering with the of GPR wave more than it is Ian because of that soil moisture variability. And this variability is just kind of naturally occurring. So the water, so the amount of water the soil can hold is just gonna change because you know it's not the exact soil in the exact same place. So that's more pronounced when it's drier because when it's wetter, everything's just wet. 
okay, so I want to go further into this, look further into the, these results. So I'm going to expand how I determine those hotspot groupings. So by grouping them differently, that's going to change their center points, and this will change the distance between them and the burials. And by doing that, I want to see if that affects just the general accuracy at all, or if that maybe favors drier conditions or maybe favors wetter conditions. Additionally, I took another sort of grid soil moisture combination that one Saturday when it was really cold and I want to see if like the temperature affects that at all and if so, how. There's also um, this concept of like anti hot spots where areas in between hot spots that don't have the hot spot, but they're like the same shape. And like if you correlate that with grave locations too, I want to see how that affects it and if maybe the graves are in areas where there aren't hot spots. Yeah, and this is that cold day depth slice 3D image that I mentioned. It's a little sneak peek that I haven't gotten around to like really analyzing, but fun. And it does more like rep represent her like Hurricane Ian like state, at least to me but there's still like some differences in there that I want to explore. Okay, so the main takeaways here is that wetter is better. So GPR is more accurate in the P4 parking lot cemetery after like a big precipitation event. And generally just when the soil moisture content is overall at a high. And that's because the moisture gradient matters. So once again, at P4 parking lot, the moisture gradient will be more homogenous when it's wet. And that's why it is more accurate because it's the sort of offset or interference of the swim moisture on the wave is just kind of, it's the same overall. And then I also mentioned the hotspot geometry affects accuracy. So when it's all spread out like that, it's more likely to hit graves that are also all spread out. But if the graves are more like clustered together, something like the July graph would be more accurate because that those hotspots are also all clustered together. And as a general recommendation for a, a GPR survey, I would recommend first figuring out when that soil moisture gradient is that is so homogenous because at P4, it's like that when it's super wet, but that's not necessarily true for all locations or in areas or even like just soil types. So acknowledgements, Dom and Eric for working with me on this project, the William & Mary Geology Department for funding and also just like being the reason I'm doing this project. <laughs> Um, the CW Foundation for letting me use P4 Hydro Lab for emotional support, and, <laughs> and then my family and friends.